Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Anantara Golden Triangle and the Force and the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation Elephant Professional Lecture here. Um, I'm in far north Thailand. I don't think I can see any elephants this morning, but here I am. Um, and this morning, having, uh, having complained or celebrated last week that we finally managed to get uh, a person to give a lecture who was from a state or from a country where elephants roamed. Um, we've managed to make it a double today and we have Becky Xu Chen from, uh, from Yunnan uh, who will be talking about China's last wild elephants. Um, there's 300 of them and they, they are actually doing fairly well thanks to the efforts of herself and, and a few generations of, of, of excellent conservationists up there. Uh, many people, it's very interesting to me, many people um, don't even know that there are wild elephants in China. Um, and until very recently, I would say that they were our closest wild elephants every time anybody asked us here in the Golden Triangle. Although about a month ago, a herd of wild elephants wandered out of Myanmar on the Chiang Mai Chiang Rai border. Um, and they're about 50 kilometers from us. So I've got to go and investigate them. But I will still say they're our closest wild elephants up on the Thai Lao, uh, sorry, Chinese Lao border. Um, and we're very, very lucky to have an expert and conservationist in them who's currently chasing um, Yangtze River dolphins, which is another subject altogether, which we could talk about for hours. But since this is an elephant professional lecture, we better make a talk about elephants. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Plenty of people in the Zoom, um, hopefully lots of people on Facebook to learn about China's last wild elephants and the, the, the very, very strong efforts that are going on to protect them up there only about 250 kilometers from, from where I'm sitting at the moment. So without further ado, I will hand you over to, to Becky Xu and she will tell us all about it. Becky, thank you very much for joining. Yeah. And thank please tell you, us all about John. it. Thank you for this wonderful um, event. And I'm very honored to be here to share about the story about trans elephants. Yeah, so I will share my screen and hopefully you can see my slides. Yeah, can you see that? Yeah, can you see my slides well? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, so morning, everyone. Thank you to be here to learn about the stories about Asian elephants. And I'm Becky, so, so I will start from myself. I started to work on elephants since 2010, when I was a master's student in National University of Singapore. So by, by, uh, back to that time, I was still struggle to find out my my, my um, thesis, like what I should work on. Then I decided to go back to Yunnan to work on the species, Asian elephants, that only found in Yunnan province of China. So this was about me back to 2010. And I am a city girl, and I'm from Kuomein, the capital city of Yunnan. And with my 50 liters backpack, I went to the reserve in Sichuan Banna. And that time I stayed with the family from Bulan village. So uh, just give you some background. So Yunnan has 26 uh, minority groups and the Bulan is one of them and who are living in the high mountains. So where is about, here is a map of China and the grain shows the distribution range of Asian elephants. You can see the grain and here is the Yunnan, Yunnan province. And all the elephants are mainly distributed into um, the reserves which are quite patchy and isolated. And the elephants in Yunnan also uh, link to the populations, for example, in Laos and potentially with Myanmar. And here is a place where I went to back to 2010. This location just in the heart of the reserve. And by that time, I don't know much about elephants. And my impression was that and elephants could be very cool and very cute and played an important role in the culture, like in, uh, in Chinese culture, like in other elephant ranch countries. And even now, um, this picture is just taken uh, maybe two months ago by one of my friends, and he went to the Jinghong. Jinghong is the capital city of Sichuan Banna. So then the Sichuan Banna prefecture hosts about more than 200 elephants. So you can see the elephant symbols everywhere like on the road and also the lot of like the tourist souvenirs and also in front of um, like restaurants, cafe shops and the temples. And even if you go to the very old Dai, Dai uh, like the Thai people, go to the very old Dai village, go to the temple, you can find the old elephant Bible. So talking about how people, they coexisted with elephants 
back to a thousand years ago. So they played a very important role in our culture. So back to that time, I think elephants must be so cool and must, uh, must be so friendly, just like if you go to Thailand to see John, so you can have a close inter uh, interaction with elephants. So I asked my guide, I had a few of the guides, to say, oh, can you take me to, um, to see the wide camera? And this guy, he looked and he only asked me one question. He said, can you climb up the tree? So that's why I feel very shocked to say why I should climb up a tree. And he told me because the white elephants, they are very dangerous. They are the top dangerous white animal on the land. So I started to investigate the relationships between elephants and the local communities. And I, re I realized that so elephants are not as, um, like as friendly as we saw them in the zoo or um, on the televisions. So they read the crops, and sometimes they hear the cars. And right now you find more and more uh, media reports about they kill the people. And okay, occasionally in the past, not now anymore. So the angry farmers may kill the elephants. So back to 2010, I started to, to, to learn about like human elephant conflict. So which is the big, biggest threat to Asian elephant conservation in China. So it's a huge challenge. I think all the uh, elephant ranch countries facing this um, the, the challenge, but this is the top one in China. And right now you can see people still worship elephants. Um, they still have the misunderstanding or confusion and the curiosity if the elephants come to the village. And so this is a video posted by people, uh, by some like local villagers on their social media. You can say like elephants came to the village but the people, they, they choose to stay. They stay to watch. But we think this is the big, um, the, the priority, the big priority right now is how to alert these people to raise their safety awareness because elephants are dangerous. So just give you an example. So this is the footage produced by Yunnan government trying to tell the village that the elephants are dangerous and you must leave. When they are coming. So they publish it online to, uh, to tell people the Asian elephants they are dangerous. So there's a real footage taken in the uh, in the in the field in the near the village. They're trying to highlight that the elephants are wild animals. So you shouldn't watch them. You must leave immediately if you receive alert from the government. So it's a situation right now in, in China, in Yunnan. So elephants, they lose the fear and they get so close to human settlements. And maybe just three or four days ago, we got, we got another report to say like one woman, it was cute. Was well, not cute, but like they were injured by elephants. So the government made this video and published online, trying to alert people to say, if elephants are coming, you must leave. So this is the most important and the top priority for the work right now. Sorry. So why, why HEC, the human elephant conflict, is so severe in China? You can say the picture here is over national reserve national parks and you can find like villages are just in the middle of the reserve it means that we don't have a hard boundary so villages they live in gen uh, generation and generations like the bulan people which i mentioned and besides bulan people we have Thai people honey people meow people wild people so lots of like uh, minority groups they are living in that forest for generations and also um, maybe since the uh, 1980s, China started to plant rubbers. You can see the mountains, it's not forests, it's rubber monocultures all covered the mountains and the mountains. And the people, they get into uh, rubber plantations for rubber in the morning and also after the sunset. So this time, actually the elephants are quite active. So under such situations, 
the encounting rates for people to meet elephants are quite high. It means that the HEC, the human elephant conflicts are more and more difficult to avoid. So back to that time when I was uh, studying in Singapore, uh, my research focused on, on uh, insurance. I'm trying to understand how we can help the government to develop a more fair and a special explicit insurance to increase the farmer's tolerance. So you can, if you are interested, you can download this paper, which was published in 2013 on biological conservation. And we found out that actually both farmers and even the tourists, they are willing to pay for the, for the portion of the insurance premiums to help to increase the farmer's tolerance because the rubber is so valuable. And after 2012, I got my first job with the word, a famous charity, the Zoological Society, Society of London, and not elephants and work on multiple species. For example, this one is a Chinese giant salamander, which um, is the largest amphibian in the world. And then I work on the gibbons as well. And then we have like a 200, like a new, um, identify the skywork gibbon also only found in Yunnan. And right now I'm working on this species, the Yangtze finless porpoises, which has a very close relationship with Bai Ji. And this species also have, have only 100 individuals left in the wild and also the birds. So from 2012, when I started my work with the cell, it's about only, uh, it's already eight years. And I learned about a lot of like conservation issues. Like for these species, you can see on the picture. So they all have a very complicated challenges to work on. And since that time, I realized that conservation needs something more than science. So we can publish good article, we can provide good data to support evidence-based conservation, but for conservation, for the future of the species, we need more. And although, I left the area of elephants for several, several years, but I still have my heart with the elephants. So in 2017, I believe that I already got my capacities, my skills on. So I decided to go back to Yunnan, go back to the place where I'm from, to go back to the place where I started my conservation career. And I want to do something for elephants, but not only the research itself. So you can say the elephants, the female elephants, she already grew up <laughs> into a big adult. So when I came back to Sichuan Banan, Quebec, came back to Yunnan in 2017, I started to think that I as an individual person, I'm alone. So the things I can do is quite limited. So why not collaborate? There must be a lot of young professionals who share the same, the same passion. So if we can, Collaborate with each other, our team could be stronger and our action can be more sustainable. Then um, being inspired actually by me, the, Malaysia, uh, the management and ecology of Malaysian elephants group, I created this network called CC, the conservation and education of Chinese elephants. So at the very beginning, I was very young. So I, I conducted the, the like young professionals, the young um, scientists, so who working on the front line on Asian elephants together to say, we can have our own network and we can support each other. We can better share the knowledge. And also we, we may have a better understanding of how we can help elephants. And we want, also want to make CC more cross sector. So not only with people working on elephants, we want to work with other people from different backgrounds, for example, from arts, we want to work with business sectors. We want to make our voice louder. And not only in country, so why not? We work transboundary because elephants not only found in China, but found in other countries as well. Especially the elephants in Yunnan, they cross border to Laos and Myanmar. So the long-term future for Chinese elephants rely on transboundary collaborations. So, and luckily in 2017, I became a member of IUCN specialist group on Asian elephants. And I thought that I had the 
um, access to the wider range of experts to help with developing the conservation strategies for Chinese elephants. Just give you an example about over CC members, they're all like young professionals, for example, Yang Zichen, he's working uh, with the Beijing Forestry University. And right now he's working for Yunnan Forestry uh, Bureau. And his passion is to using the camera traps and the DNA techniques to, uh, to do the individual ident uh, identifications of each elephant and trying to understand how many of them in China. And also his area focusing on the, uh, the China, uh, China Lao border. And he has a strong passion to support the cross-border conservation. Yeah. And this is Chen Ying, and currently um, he's a postal in Hong Kong University. And he, her passion is on human elephant conflicts. How can using uh, the spatial monitoring to predict the hot spots for HEC so that we can better match, manage it. Similar to Chen Ying, Huang Chen currently working in San Yasen University, and his passion is also on HEC. So he used both questionnaire survey techniques and spatial monitoring trying to uh, study on another area which has a very severe human elephant conflicts as well. And Jiang Zhichen is a student, um, was a student uh, in Yunnan University, and currently um, he began his career with the NGO working on elephants. And his passion is to understand how, what elephants eat. So trying to know about their foraging behavior. And this guy is interesting. His name is Gong Zilin. He has a strong interest in social science. And what he did is to working with several villagers in another prefecture where elephants are found right now to develop the elephant friendly rice. Um, so for example, he motivates the villagers to plant the local rice and he using the very smart like a marketing strategy to sell this rice to Beijing, to big cities. And the money returned to the villagers to, to support the better management of the land so that they can mitigate the threats to um, elephant habitat. And this is, a, I think this is the coolest part so these three people here, they are botanists. So this group of botanists, they have a strong passion, strong passion about um, helping the villagers. So they developed the, 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 the pro project, the very um, innovative project to alert villagers that the elephants are coming. So here is the villagers working and you can see this all like rubber plantations and surrounded by villagers. So elephants came to their villages quite, quite, quite often. So they're using the, the techniques actually other countries use as well to, uh, it's a camera trapped method. Sorry. So once the elephant's picture were taken, so this picture, picture skin can go to villagers to alert them. But what's different from others is that they develop this speaker, the loudspeaker. So, once they received the picture of the elephants, so uh, the botanists, they were um, make, a, make a message. So they test this message to the speaker and the speaker will read through the message. For example, the elephants are coming. It's in about like five, uh, 500 meters from you. So you have to return, something like that. So now you already entered electronic surveillance area. Here's an example, like one camera trap to take the, uh, the, 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 the video about the elephant. So they send out, they send out alerts. And a few seconds later, they went to another area so they can use the elephant's roots to alert villagers. And what is very exciting is that, so China right now, they really devoted a lot of money and trying to, to um, in, encourage the human elephant coexistence. So they, they spend a lot of money to develop the, the center called elephant, elephant monitoring center, which is a drone base. So basically they developed a drone team about like 10, 20 people 
and they're using the drone to fly around the villages on the 24 hours basis. For example, he, uh, this picture was taken in the uh, monitoring center. It's like real time monitoring. So they can say the elephants right now are in one village. So they can evacuate the villages before the elephants came. And this is a, a camera, uh, it's not a camera, sorry, it's a drone um, video taken in the evening. So they're using the thermal drone to fly to monitor the elephants. So you can see the video as well, which I took uh, from the live stream screen in the monitoring center. So you can see, you can see the elephants so clear. So then back at the time, I found that actually China still has a strong capacity and a commitment for Asian elephant conservation. So in addition to the young scientists, in addition to CCE, so we should maybe considering more stakeholders to join. So to have more like NGOs, like a reserve the managers to have the tourist companies or to have the like insurance companies together. So maybe we can find more opportunities to make our work stronger, to really do something uh, valuable to the, to, to the ground conservation. So then back to 2017. So under the um, Association of Tropical Bi uh, Bio biological con uh, conference, big conference. So we organized the small side event. I think this is the first time that we coordinated people together in the same place to discuss elephants, to share the knowledge about what they did for elephants. So we have the people from the reserves, from the elephant valley, um, from the Chinese Academy of Sciences and from different universities. And we have NGOs from other countries together to share about the current existing knowledge about the elephants. And we found out that these messages actually, when we put them together, we get a better idea, a bigger picture about the elephants in China. So this is a very useful skill. So then in 2019, with the post of Sichuan Banana Tropical, uh, Tropical Botanical Garden, we organize um, this like working groups to say we, we are not only sharing knowledge, but we need to work together to identify the priorities for research and conservation of Chinese elephants. Because to reserve, the priority is to manage the forest. For the villagers, the priority is about the safety. And for the NGOs, the priority is how to, um, to promote the coexistence. So to different stakeholders, the priority is different. So our vision for this workshop is to make people to stay together and work on the priorities, to have everybody to agree on the priorities. Once we have the great priorities, then we have a better chance to help with the elephants. We have the better chance to coordinate the resources from different areas to support elephants. So um, just give you an example, and we have different themes about um, research priorities and we have different themes about conservations. So people spend two days all together to identify what we should do on elephants and which are the priorities for elephants under each theme. Give you um, So um, this is the meeting room back in 2017. And we have people from IUCN. This is Siling. Yeah, this is the botanist. <laughs> and this is from the State Forestry Administration. So you can think of people, they have very uh, hot debates trying to go into a common ground. And here is like a, a different group, they, they report on the results and they need to get the buy in and agreement from other groups as well. And this guy, very cool. He from a, Ch a Chinese Ac 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 Academy of Transportation. And it's Professor Shikun from Forestry, uh, Beijing Forestry University. He's the leading um, the elephant conservation in China. And he got the resources from the government directly. And this is Richard Collett, and he's a famous biologist 
<laughs> yeah, and he hosted a workshop in Shumana as well. And it's very cool that the botanics garden is really generated resources to support over um, networks for Asian elephants. Yeah, and also um, taking this chance, we got um, the opportunities to take people to weather the field. And this is Elephant Valley. So the government developed a rescue center there. And this rescue center um, is trying to raise awareness. And here actually you can see the fence. So the fence is fencing the villager in and trying to fence out the elephants. So they spent about two millions to set, set up this big fence. And here's a very cool, actually, this is developed by the Chinese Academy of Transportation because they are developing the roads. So, so they're developing the LED, trying to alert the cars to come in to tell the elephants are around this area. And this is the Botanist Deng Yun. So who, Deng Yun set up the camera traps, you can see here, on the top of the tree. So the camera traps will take the videos or pictures of, of the elephants, and the picture will go back to the speaker, can read through to the villagers that the elephants are around. So you can see the speaker here. So Deng Yun, he is attacking that. So he is sending the text to the speaker, and speaker read through, and here's the mountain center, I, I told you guys. So the government, they invested money to make it a center so we can, they can have a real time monitoring about the elephants near the villages. Because the human safety now is of a priority. Only if we ensure the safety of the people, we can conserve the elephants. And these guys, we are from Chinese Academy of Transportation, and they are installing the monitoring cameras in the uh, under the overpass above the highway. So in trying to understand how often elephants are using um, this wildlife crossing infrastructure. So I think this is so cool. And this is the first time that will make people together to identify the priorities together. And also uh, four months later, we organized another meetings. So in the Kunming Institute of Survey and Design, actually this institute is directly managed by all the top uh, governments, uh, which are managing um, all the wild animals in China. So this government called the State Forestry and the Grassland Administration. And this time we invite people from other countries, from all the neighboring countries. So we got representatives from IUCN, we have representatives from Laos and from Myanmar. Then we have a better understanding that if we want to conserve elephants in China, how we should foster the co collaborations across the border. And then I realized that once we developed this transboundary conservation network, it not only benefit elephants, but it would benefit a range of species in this area. So then I got funding from British consulate and got funding from Trans Academy of Sciences and we organize the bigger conference, trying to identify the transboundary opportunities for different species. And yeah, and for this meeting, we invited the people from different countries to sit together to talk about, to talk about different species around Yunnan. So this lady is from the Yunnan Forestry uh, government and she was reporting to people what we have and what the opportunities are on the China, Laos, China, Myanmar and the China, Nepal, uh, Nepal, uh, Nepal border. And this is very important, not only for China's belt and the road initiatives, but it's also important for national park development. And we got the bill, actually he de devoted himself to sign and allow uh, conservation. So he came to share about what he got in Lao site. And he told us that, that, that there are like 10 elephants. 
and got Ms. Zizak. And I think it's the first time they got the representative from Lao coming to tell about what happened on the other side. Because of the reserve he works on, works in, just the border, bordering with the reserve in China. And they got Pan from WF, and he has expertise on, on the trees. And trying to identify the priority areas to work. And they got Ahimsa, and now he moved to China to help us. He shared about what Malaysia, the main working on Asian elephants. So we have 48 organizations from eight different countries. And this time, I think the breaks do because we got, as I mentioned, the Chinese Academy of Transportation. They are the ones who are building the roads. So we're talking about how we make the cross sectors to work well. And he, Mr. Chen, so he is working on elephants for more than 30 years. And he was here to tell people that how we can coordinate better. And they got the leader from the Forestry Bureau that they would commit to this network to support the transponder conservation. So we got 80 people, 80 experts, so who are leading the conservation and the research in different areas. For example, Mr. Chen, he set up a center, a monitor center in Myanmar, and the Sichuan Banna as well, trying to understand the biodiversity. We got Maggie from Dr. Says as well, and he has a, she has a strong expertise on demand reduction how we can using social and the marketing uh, economy science to understand the people's demand between the uh, behind one of trees. And so the Chinese from Hong Kong U and she works on the human elephant complex called sports. And also we got Mr. Yi, Dr. Yi, so works on the Tibetan culture, how we can understand the culture to facilitate conservation. And you can see that more and more people. So we're sitting together for the whole day to share the knowledge about the same area, how people can work together to support the conservation for the transboundary species, not only elephants, but a vast area, uh, um, area of, um, of conservation. Yeah. So then I think in addition yeah, to the stakeholder engagement, the public advocacy is also very important because we need public support only if we have public support of conservation can run longer. Then I found a bookstore called Elephant Books. I think because they are called Elephant Books, they must um, have an interest to support elephant related conservation advocacy work. So then since 2017, again in November, together with Elephant Books, we set up the TED style talks, just like this talk, but this, um, but this one is offline, uh, the talks in the bookstore called We Care. So We Care is a tab there uh, conservation talks uh, that we want to share about exciting stories. And we want to bridge the tourists, uh, we, sorry, we want to bridge the scientists with the general public to care about the conservation of different species. So at the very beginning, we are very small scale. We only have a small books, bookstore. We only have like 50 general public from Yunnan. So this is my friend, Harry, and he worked in China for 10 years, and he is sharing about the exciting story about the snow leopards to Yunnan people. And then um, in addition to the test I talk, we also host like panels. For example, this is last year, we got elephant experts in different areas to sit together to tell the public and we film it. Um, to answer the questions from public and what's the opportunities and the challenges about Asian elephants. And now we've got a bigger scale. We have like 300 people and we have like a thousand people online. So this is the new event I organized um, on the World Elephant Day this year, um, August 12th. And not only the sharing about the elephant conservation, we got uh, like a field station to show people what we, we did in the field and how we identify the elephants on the individual level. And we cover different topics, like we talk about the ivory in Africa, 
So this is the biggest threat to African elephant. And we got so, like media to speak as well, like how media can play a role to tell the word about the stories because not only China has elephants, but neighbor countries like Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand has the story of elephants. So the media team, they help us to make the stories and publish into different languages to other countries as well. And they got Ahimsa, he always supported me and he's here as well. And he shared about how Malaysian um, government and the conservationists are doing the work for elephants. So we can bring back this experience back to China. And also using the network, um, because this though is a British NGO and using network, we're trying to build a dialogue with, um, with the UK, like royal um, communities. For example, when Prince William came, when Princess Anne came, we're talking about how Sino-UK policy engagements can support the old elephant work in China. For example, like I also met with Prince William in March when he visited China. And also I met with Theresa May, uh, the prime minister as well, to talk about how UK NGOs can play a role to, to bridge the gaps can put more contribution to Chinese species conservation. So that's it. I think the sharing of my today, and I hope that one day you guys can come to Sichuan Bana and I can take you guys to see the elephants to know more about what we did to support conservation. Yeah, thank you. That's it. Can you guys all follow up my talk? <laughs> Becky, that's that's amazing. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. How the internet works. <laughs> not not only for um, for the talk, but also for bringing us up to date with um, with what has been going on in in China. Because too often, I think you guys get get stuck behind the great firewall, as they call it, and we don't know what you've been up to. And I can say about 10 years ago, um, and for those who don't know, I suppose I should plug it right next door to the tropical botanical gardens, there's the Anantara Sichuan Bana, so, which I'm pronouncing badly, I know. Sipsong Bana, <laughs> I'll pronounce it. Yeah, time. great, great pronunciation, um, accurate. <laughs> so I went up there 10 years ago to look for elephants and I met Richard and I met some people there, but, but at, at that time, um, it, no, they, I found lots of elephant dung. I drove a lot, a lot, many, many kilometers. Um, I went up to Pua with some other people as well. and. Uh, uh, and we couldn't find any elephants. Um, and now it seems as though in the last 10 years, thanks to what you've done, and, and, and I know you've got a lot of colleagues up there as well, the network of, um, of, of, what, of, of how you help um, has increased so much that you could definitely show me elephants because you seem to know exactly where they are. Um, so fantastic work. I do have some questions, but first of all, I will open it to the, the Zoom room. If anybody has any questions on the Zoom, um, please do unmute yourself or unmute yourself and ask the question yeah i saw a question on zoom on the chat posted by zach um yes okay so, we'll go with uh, zach's question oh zach do you want to ask the question yourself <laughs> i can see you um so uh, the question was uh, it seems like most most measures that you mentioned during your lecture are about protecting the villagers who pose little harm to the elephants so does it mean poaching and capturing of the wild elephants is not a main threat to the population in Yunnan? Yes, in China, um, we don't have any poaching at all. I think maybe since five, six years ago, no more poaching. And I think occasionally you will find like elephants died from HEC. Uh, and in some cases, it's not like intended by people, but like, for example, hit by the car because they cross the highway and sometimes they raid the crops or raid the, the crops with a very high level of pesticides. So like two teenager young elephants got killed. Yeah, so I think right now the biggest threat is about human safety. <laughs> the elephants, they are well, and I think they, they also the behavior changed, not changed, but like for like us, like different people have different personality, but for the one herd of the elephants in Monghai, about 18 elephants, they are super aggressive. So they get into the villages and they kill the people like quite often. So I think the current, uh, the current priority is to how to separate this herd with humans. 
yeah, not like people killing elephants, but how we can prevent elephants killing people. <laughs> I think it's whole priority. Yeah. Yeah, just to follow up, I think China has some very, uh, very strong laws against poaching. One of the reasons there are, there is, there is no poaching, um, and they can say that with confidence is they have some very strong laws. I, I at yeah. some point, I heard maybe the death penalty even, um, and very, very strictly enforced. Um, so that's that's yeah. one of the that, that certainly helps reduce poaching. Yeah, and also of elephants, only three hundred, and they are quite um, like condensed into certain, uh, certain uh, like a very small reserves. So we don't have much land management anymore. So I think it's easier compared with like other countries who has more elephants. Yeah. Ahimsa, you've you've switched your phone on or your camera on. Do you have a question? No, no, no question. I, I, I think uh, Vicky is doing a fantastic job. So just congratulate her. And then, you know, I, I guess the, the point is, what do you think are the, the priorities now, Becky? What are the, the key steps to improve elephant conservation in the next 10 years or something like that? Uh, I think the top priority for me is to how to coordinate the resources together. It's like the reason why we held a priority uh, workshop because I myself, I don't have the priority. Uh, I cannot decide the priority for elephants, but my own priority is how to make the people to work together. Once you understand where we lack the resources and where we have the like funding shortfalls and where we have the lack of knowledge and we can make the people to work together, I think it's a priority to ensure the long-term conservation of elephants. If you're talking about the elephants themselves, I think the priority is to, to manage the relationship with the villagers, how we can balance that how we can stop people being killed by elephants. I think it's a long-term solution to make people to coexist with them because elephants will not disappear. And we hope that they don't disappear. <laughs> and how we can protect the villagers. I think this, this is the priority in China. Yeah. Okay. Um, people, go ahead, Hinsa. Are things that people can learn from China? So in a other other rate range countries. So I think China does things a bit in a different way, and that leads to more kind of you know out of the box solutions. And so, in what kind of things could China export to other countries for elephant conservation? National parks, I think, through the Belt and the Road initiatives. For example, like a, a meeting happened in October because they want to make a huge reserves. So I think. So, I'm not sure about other countries, but I think China can do. For example, like the Snow Leopard National Park, Sanjiangyuan, in Tibetan Plateau, they can do have the power, authority, and have the money to relocate people to other areas. So I think if China, they decided to make a national park, it will happen. And once they make, make an international park, it will connect it to other countries, like Laos, like in Namha. Namha has a population go directly with, with China. So if you don't have a collaboration with neighboring country, if your national park don't cover the area, we will also fail. So I think one of the collaboration is how to make the national park linked to each other. And we agree on the management plan. And also the Belt Road Initiative, um, I just add a few words on like um, the Chinese Academy of Transportation. I think that they are the very key partners to work on that, um, to working with the transportation group on the IUCN and how we can make sure that the the, the new the highway or the bridge or the canal, the linear infrastructure once the building across um, the neighboring countries, how we could avoid and mitigate the threat to elephants and other wild species. I think it's what we should do to to um, help say to in response to China's top uh, top policy. Yeah, the Belt Road Initiative and mm -hmm. National Park. Yeah, uh, the system. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah. You answered my question as well. That's exactly what I was going to ask because we, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had Lydia Tiller on, who is working in Savo in uh, in Kenya, and she was discussing the underpasses on the on the uh, on the railway between um, Nairobi and Mombasa, mm -hmm. and how there were under underpasses there, but there weren't enough. And of course, that's part of Belt and Road. So I'm, I'm fascinated to learn. I was going to give you the homework of talking to your Academy of uh, Academy of Transportation to make sure that. Uh, that they could build build into the Belt and Road, but it seems as though, as with everything else, you're already 15 steps ahead of us. So fantastic work. 
Um, yeah, and also I'm a member of the transportation group, so I should, I think I can use in my passion to bridge also the Asian elephant experts with transportation group, how we can make a guideline and how we can engage other stakeholders like in China to be more aware about wildlife before they build the roads. I think it's over passion. Yeah, in the next maybe five, 10, 30 or forever years. <laughs> Perfect. I want to talk to you about some elephants in Cambodia where, where a, a port is going up as well, but we can talk about that later. Um, fantastic, fantastic work. Um, so uh, Jody is asking from Facebook is, are the children in China edu educated about elephant conservation and endangered species at all? So is it part of the curriculum or is it something that you're adding on top of that, I guess is the question. I think it's also very interesting, like in China, in our curriculums and also like in televisions, we have elephants. But the stories about the African elephants, when you see the videos or, or um, like see the black like films, it's all about like Savannah, like Africa. We, we know about zebra, <laughs> we know about lions, but there are a lack of knowledge about Asia species, about the Chinese elephants. So I think right now, my passion as well, how we can um, be proud about the species that are found in China near our um, areas. So we're trying to, it's the reason why I developed the, the We Care uh, Salon, trying to tell the public more about the elephant's uh, stories in China. And according to the survey, not only the children, but according to the survey about general, like a public tourists, about 70 or 80% of them, they have never heard about human elephant conflicts. So we have a huge knowledge gap here. So it's, it's the reason why um, in my last part of my presentation, I think advocacy um, to public is very important. Yeah, so hopefully in five years later, there are formal curriculums about Chinese elephants in over children's book. May I interrupt with a yeah. quick question here? Like, so, so. Well. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, may I interrupt with a question here? Like, I'm yeah. just Go ahead, wondering. Zach if this also applies to the other species other than elephants as well like are the children more are the children know uh, educated more about the lions and zebras in africa than the giant salamanders than the yanzi dolphins that you mentioned or So sorry, I didn't get your question very well. Your connection seems not very good. Can you repeat? <laughs> sorry, the question. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, the children are more interesting. Yeah, because just now you said uh, the children are more educated about the African elephants and their own elephants here in China. So does the does the same phenomenon like uh, uh, occur? that the children are actually learning more about the lions or the like the rhinos and other big species and other places than their own biodiversity here locally. Becky, you're still muted. Oh, so can you guys hear me? Sorry, internet arrow. So, so what's the question again, Zach? Sorry, sorry, for, yeah, sorry, the internet lost just now. So okay. you asked about children, yeah. I, I will re-ask because with that. Uh, okay. So Zach, Zach is asking. Um, we've we've talked about elephants and um, uh, the general population, especially kids in China, knowing more about perhaps African than than Asian elephants. Is is the same true of say the giant salamander and the the red panda and the Yangtze dolphin? and all of the others, or they know more, do you feel they know more about African wildlife than they do about uh, the wildlife that they actually have at home in their own backyard? Yeah, I agree. I think Asian elephants are lucky because people know about Yunnan and they know that you, elephants is a symbol of Yunnan. Uh, same as like green peacock, like each province has over uh, like an ambassador. Like if you go to Sichuan, the giant panda is an ambassador. But I think for like Yangtze um, River stopping and for like a gibbons or like the giant salamander, I think maybe the rate is much, much lower than elephants. So I think it's why I think we have a very high priority to uh, 
to conduct like environmental education to talk about over endemic species, like for the species that happen on over backyard as as, as a joint. Also, it's very important that we collaborate with other sectors. The reason why the children need more about African species because on the television, it's more about it's all about like Africa. And the, if you look into the um, like documentary, like BBC, it's all talking about like other wonderful lands. But should we really work with our local like filmmakers? Like uh, like the videos I played, it's all made by my friends. <laughs> like volunteers so we should make our own films to tell people about the species in our backyard so i think this is also my strong passion on that yeah you don't answer that okay yes you do um, <laughs> so <laughs> one more question from facebook from angela um was asking that um you uh, china as a country has political will to establish protected areas um do they have the appetite? I'm sure they have the capacity if they have the will uh, to support protection long term. So if they establish the protected areas, um, they, they, they presumably do they have the question is, do they have a long term plan for keeping them established and protecting them and all the other things that are needed? For them? Yes, I believe China has the money, has the capacity and have, as, you as I mentioned in my presentation, you can say like people, even botanists, they are working on Asian elephants. So I think once we made a plan, it will go very long run. Even Himsa, he came to China. So now we have a strong research team and then we have a lot of people to, yeah, we're sitting on the panel to, to work together. So I believe we have, yeah, the capacity to do that. As long as we work together and the coordinate the resources together so we can make the work come, coming true. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, from Facebook, Jody's, I, I think, agreeing with you that it's easier to educate kids about faraway problems than those. Oh, she's asking a question. Is it easier to educate kids about faraway problems than those at home? Um, which I think is a universal question, but we'll, is that for, that's for China as well. Um, yeah. And then the other question would, is, is funding adequate in China for your needs? <laughs> okay, so two questions. The first question, I think, is a universal question. And recently, I was learning the course about conservation psychology. So I found this question is a bias. It's called about like stone age, the bias that is written in your gene. Like for human beings, we're only talking about the problems that are far away. We're saying, okay, it's not related to us. We're talking, for example, like oh, our lake is polluted, but maybe somewhere else is, is worse. And we don't, we are not long vision. So we're only talking about the threats right now. Like, oh, I'm cold right now, but I'm not talking about climate change because of the gene. It's a paper, actually, I can share it with you. It's called the Stone Age Bias. Due to over gene, we don't care about the future. So, how, so then how we should make people to, to link this threat to our current now is something we need to work on. And we need more people to work on, like psychologists. It's the reason why I learned about psychology right now. <laughs> yeah, and another question. So for us, I think it's like an unbalanced resources. Like the governments, they were allocated the funding directly to like national parks, or like researchers, they were get money directly through like Chinese Academy of um, like uh, like the Chinese uh, Nature Foundations. They they have all the uh, the funding source. But for us, like NGO, it all depends. Like we need to get funding um, like through Ocean Park or through other conservation foundations. So it's not adequate. The funding is never adequate, but we we can still do some, some things. So right now, like in China, for the we care, for example, the tax, uh, tax um, story sharing, we have zero funding, but we write for four years, we got support, like all income support, like bookstore give me free venue and my speakers, like they come here for free. So, and now we got like, like a beers, they sponsor me to say, I don't give you money, but I give you 2000 bottles of beers, you sell it. And then the money goes to, goes to use. I think once we work across sector, we will have the money to help us. It's a thing, not only about the money, but about the passion. If you can really find the intrinsic value from different sectors, then we are strong. Like Rob, uh, like, like John, right, as well. You organize this one. I don't think you have funding for that, but you do that. And you can get Anna Tara to support us in the future, maybe. <laughs> 
I was going to say, don't be shy to write to me about Anantara Sichuan Ban. We will, we we can discuss that for sure. Um, and and let me know later which beer, so I can um, so I can buy some beer and support that as well. I'm always happy to support okay, cool. by drinking beer. Yeah, so everybody can play a role. Everybody, all of you, you can find your own talents, and your talents can support conservation in different way. So conservation cannot only led by scientists. Everybody, you have an important role to play. I think. Yeah, this is what I want to deliver. Perfect. And as we have no more questions, I think that's absolutely the perfect play, the way to end the end the talk. So, um, unless there are any more urgent questions, no. Thank you very much, Becky. Fantastic. Um, really, really, perhaps the most interesting one we've done with with without any offence to any of our other very very interesting speakers. It's fantastic to know what's going on. Um, so close to us, but but so far away. Thanks to communication differences and everything else. So, thank you for enlightening us and. Um, Yes, I think all that remains for me to say is to thank Anantara here in the Golden Triangle for, for allowing me to sit in the bar and, and chat away, yeah. and for lending me their yeah. Wi-Fi. And thank you to whoever on whoever it is that lends you their Wi-Fi in the, up in up on the Yangtze there yeah. um, to, to allow yeah. us to do it. Um, yeah. yeah, we will talk about um, Anantara Sichuan Banner. I will I will give them a plug. Um, and as soon as uh, as soon as borders are reopened, you, you've whetted my appetite. I'm coming straight back up the road. As I say, it's only yeah. about an eight-hour drive. Fantastic drive, actually, from here yeah. through Laos up to uh, yeah. up to Yunnan. Um, and I will come and see yourself and yeah, Himse, and we will go and find some medical stuff. Yeah, and thank you, guys. You're all welcome to China. And if you have any questions, I, uh, John can share my contact details. Yeah, if you want to explore more, I would very like to share with you. And yeah, please be proud of yourself. Everyone who are on this talk, I think you can play a role to elephant conservation just to think about what you can do if you want to do we can make it to come true we can help you to help elephants as well yeah it's what i want to say we all care <laughs> yeah i have nothing more to add thank yeah. you very much becky thank you thank everybody you. for listening thank and you, we, will, we will say yeah. I, oh I, I think one day See you in China yeah. one day. Um, and at 4 p.m. today, I ought to also say that we will have a, a lockdown live stream live with our elephants who are who are our captive elephants who live with us in, uh, us in our grassland. So folks on Facebook, um, please do join us for that if you're still awake. Um, it probably won't be me. I think it'll be U and Nisa again. So you can learn more about our elephants from there. But in the end, thank you very much, Becky. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We will thank see you. Thank you, everyone. Soon. Thank you. See you. Bye.